right, let's, uh, let's, let's pray together. <coughs> God, thank you so much for this time and pray that you would just, uh, just keep speaking as you have been speaking already. Awaken our minds, our bodies, our hearts, and just connect us with what you uh, have been doing and want to do even further with our ministries. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first lesson in preaching is um, this one. I mentioned to a couple people at my table over there. And if you ever have a sore throat, let me tell you what not to do. So it, I went to Walgreens during lunchtime, and uh, I got this. I had a choice between getting these cough drops, these lozenges, and these uh, this spray. And the pharmacist said, get the spray, right? Right? Get the spray or work faster. And so I got the spray, and I came back. And I was trying to play this off, you know. But I can't, and I just, since we're talking about preaching, first, first lesson is, if you're ever going to use a throat spray, make sure that when you spray it, it goes, you spray it down your throat and not around your mouth because it's a numbing agent. So let's just say I feel like I just came back from the dentist and uh, <laughs> I thought, I thought I'd better tell y'all that. That's the first lesson. I can sit down now. That's, but that's what you came and you learned from the conference. Um, yeah. Okay. Having said that, I um, thank you, Dr. Allen. Thank you. Uh, isn't this an amazing conference? Only, only two years in. And um, just doing a marvelous job. Keep it up impacting people and so just thank you and thank God for being able to connect with um, Dr. Daniel Brown and uh, my brother Dr. William Curtis. Amazing presentations, amazing sermons last night and I'm grateful for being able to partner with the two of them in this time and getting to know many of you. It's been a real, it's been a real blessing. Now I know that after lunch, <laughs> you don't stand here and talk for an hour. So I, there's something I just, there's an angle I just want to share, and then we can talk. We can go back and forth and, and talk. Um, Dr. Brown has already talked to us more about some of the mechanics of crystal-centric preaching. So her focus was on the sermon itself. And then Dr. Curtis this morning talked to us about uh, the preacher, him or herself, when it comes to self-discovery, right? So, so far we've had the sermon, we've had the preacher. Now I want to say a little bit about the world in which we preach. This this, 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 this context in which we, <coughs> in which we do this thing, um, because we don't preach in a vacuum, right? We, 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 we preach in this, in this world. So I want to say a little bit um, about this social context in which we are doing ministry right now. Preaching that changes lives, can't really change lives unless the preaching is aware of the world in which those lives live. Yep. So, one of the things, um, any sports fans here? <laughs> sports fans here? Okay. Uh, no matter what sport it is, the main ones, football, basketball, baseball, hockey, one of the things that sports teams fight for in the pursuit of championships is something called home field advantage, right? Home court advantage. When the, when the regular season is over uh, and teams get to what they call the postseason, they want to know that they will be playing in front of hospitable fans for the majority of their games. That's right, that's, that's home field, home court advantage. These teams understand that what they do on the court 
is influenced by the support they have in the stands. What they do on the court will be easier if the majority of the people in the stands are on their side. So I recently heard Christian author, professor, theologian, cultural guru, Leonard Sweet say that Christianity now plays all away games. Okay, I know it's after lunch, but let me try it again. All of our games now are away. We no longer have home field or home court advantage. Christianity, or at least some form of it, used, we, we used to have home court advantage in America. It no longer does. Now we're playing on somebody else's court. The fans in the stands are no longer hospitable to matters of faith. Teams that are not playing on their home court know that from the outset they have an extra hurdle in accomplishing their objectives. Matters of faith church mores, practices, and theology used to have an extreme home court ad advantage even in the black community. Even people who did not go to church would at least be welcoming to the message and the ways of faith, right? Almost everyone in black families had at least been exposed to ecclesiastical customs and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the most part, black folks live with a religious substratum that made us amenable to the things of faith. No longer is that the case. The current cultural belief is that life can be lived, reality can be created, and battles can be fought without God being a key player. That's the world in which we live. God has become a relic of the past. The truth is, we started losing. The truth is, and I don't want to go too deep into this, but, but, but we, we started losing home court advantage around the middle of the 17th century. When Copernicus helped us to, uh, Copernicus helped us to lose the advantage when he challenged the, what they call, the smart people call the Ptolemaic notion that the earth was at the center of the universe. This new theory this new theory, uh, the heliocentric theory is what they call it, is that the sun was the center of the universe and, and, and it elevated science and metaphysical, uh, uh, mechanical physics and all that kind of stuff. Christianity suffered a major blow. That's all I'm trying to say. Christianity suffered a major blow because the universe was no longer seen as the field of arbitrary divine action, but as this interpretal realm of law. In other words, listen, y'all, all I'm trying to say is science began to push faith out of the way. Okay? Science began to put faith out of the way. Copernicus helped us to lose home court advantage. We can only blame him. We can also put some blame on the philosopher Rene Descartes, who promulgated this idea that all knowledge was subject to question unless it was beyond all doubt. All conceptions must be doubted until proved and must have the certainty of mathematical demonstrations and all of that. In other words, if it's not empirically verifiable, it ain't true. That's what he said. Belief in God was a casualty of this philosophical system. The irony is that both Copernicus and Descartes was, were devout Catholics. They probably had no clue that their theories would hasten the move toward a secularized mindset and subsequently causing us to lose home court advantage. We thought we had the advantage after the Reformation, but such was not the case. Uh, two of our own people gave home court advantage away. Okay, so the bottom line, I'm sorry, that, that, was, that, 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 that didn't excite us too much. Um, the bottom line is that we are living in a world where God is no longer seen as a key player. Charles Taylor said that we are, our world suffers from the, from the disease of, of the malaise of, the Im of imminence. Our world has been freed from the reality of transcendence and enchantment. We're no longer enchanted by the transcendent. There appears to be no transcendent port of reference. God has been pushed out of 
the picture. Walter Brueggemann refers to this phenomenon as the dethroning of Christian privilege. Christian privilege has been dethroned. We no longer have home court advantage. We can't look to the stands for support anymore. There was a time when the Christian preacher could count on the shared premises of the listening community. The listening community no longer has shared premises. Everyone comes with their own set of ideas and beliefs. Even churches are populated by people determined to live out their own truths. In the 17th century, it was hard work to imagine a world without God. And now in the 21st century, it's hard to imagine the world with God. We now pastor, y'all. You still with me? The chicken and the mashed potatoes are starting to get to us, huh? Uh, we now pastor in the midst of atheists. And to some extent, we pastor atheists. That may be a bit hyperbolic, but but maybe not. Our churches and our communities are not inhabited by confessional atheists. Confessional atheists declare that they do not believe in God uh, with their mouths. Practical atheists never declare it with their mouths. As a matter of fact, practical atheists affirm their belief in God and Christ in credo formulae. Practical atheists actually say that they believe in God. However, they never make a connection between creed believed and life lived. Psalm 14.1. Anybody know Psalm 14.1? It's interesting, right? It says, the fool has said in his or her heart, there is no God. They have done abominable works. Fools may not say it with their mouths, but they say it in their hearts. And for the Hebrew, the heart was the center of being. The fool does not have room for God in the center of their being. So practical atheism may affirm the existence of God, but it does not see God as a key player in living. Practical atheism makes no connection between God and justice, makes no connection between God and sexuality and gender identity, it makes no connection uh, between God and racism. Practical atheism makes no connection between God and militarism. When there is no connection between God and these and other arenas of human living, the result will be chaos and confusion. When there is no connection between God and these areas of human living, the result will be the inversion of right and wrong. Listen, y'all, all I'm trying to do is just paint a picture of the world in which we preach because it's no longer the world that we used to preach in. New gods abound in the land. I said new gods abound in the land. I'm in agreement with New York University uh, academic Scott Galloway, who contends that we have four relatively new gods in our society. You ready? You ready? We got four new gods. Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. Those are our four idol gods. Those are the bells of our times. Google is the god of omniscience that knows everything. Where people used to turn to religion for answers, now we turn to Google. Google's now being asked to answer questions of deep human meaning. That's one new god that we got. Apple is viewed as the god or goddess of sex. To have an iPhone, so says Galloway, is a sign of success and influence and acts as a mating signal. <laughs> for, for some of our young people, the iPhone is an extension of themselves. It adds or takes away to their attractiveness. That's why you can't have a phone that's all cracked up. Somebody ought to help me here. That, that, that Apple is a god. Facebook is the god of love. Facebook is used to connect friends, relatives, acquaintances. In many cases, through likes and shares, it keeps a barometer of how loved and popular we are. Amazon. Yeah. 
is the God of uh, omnipotence and omnipresence, of omnipresence and omnipotence. Whatever you need, it could get it to you wherever you are as quickly as you need it. There's a new pantheon of gods that have contributed to our loss of home court advantage. This is the world in which we preach. <laughs> so here's the question, and I'm almost done so, so, so we can talk about this. Um, what are we to do as the church? How is the church empowered in this kind of climate? Uh, the very God we preach is now viewed as, as unnecessary. The preacher is seen as a VCR vendor, cute and sentimental, but obsolete. All of our games, tell somebody, all of our games are away games. What are we to do since we are dispensers of God? What's our recourse? Well, there's no one, two, three answers to this complex conundrum. However, there are some things for us to consider because a friend of mine was in a, was in a similar situation. He happened to be hanging around Athens while waiting for Silas and Timothy mm, to come and hang out with him. He was not on his home court. And while there, he noticed that the city I have, do I have two Bible readers here, right? <laughs> he noticed that the city was full of idols. Jerusalem was an ancient city of religion, right? Rome was an ancient city of politics and power. Athens was the city of philosophy and academic pursuits. It was full of idols, and Paul noticed it. He noticed the idols because he simply paid attention. So um, if we're going to preach... If we're going to preach in these times, first thing we got to do is pay attention, right? Just, just pay. Paul walked up and down the streets and noticed the busts of certain deities in the yards of people. He just paid attention. A part of our calling is to simply pay attention to what's happening around us and whose home court. We are on, just a few weeks ago, I was on a United Airlines flight that was, uh, I was leaving the Atlanta area, and as we were ascending, the plane was being tossed around by turbulence. It was a bumpy climb to the desired altitude. At the same time that all that was going on around us, the flight attendant kept giving their typical greeting and speech, sprinkled in that speech, and that, that opening was the opening greetings um, that was a repetition of the United tagline, welcome to the friendly skies. Okay, y'all, <laughs> as the plane was ascending, turbulence, the preacher kept saying welcome <laughs> to the friendly skies because the skies were anything but friendly. There was nothing that they were saying that showed any indication that they knew what was going on around us. Because as the plane was ascending, <laughs> yeah, 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 they weren't in contact with the turbulence. Uh, listen, <clears throat> all I'm trying to say is that a part of our ministry is just looking and noticing. Over half the people who attend Calvary Church in Morristown, uh, New, New Jersey don't live in Morristown. They commute in from different counties and from Pennsylvania and New York. And I'm grateful for them and appreciate the effort they made to get to church. But sometimes I'm afraid that they simply come in and go home after church without noticing what's really happening in the surrounding community. I'm not sure that they've noticed the changing demographic. I'm not sure if they notice the number of uh, African-American businesses that have dwindled down almost to nothing. I'm not sure if they noticed that churches were the last institutions in our area to fully reopen after the height of the pandemic. The only way that Paul was able to see that the city was full of idols is that he looked. To do fruitful ministry on the opposition's home court, it requires noticing what's going on around us. 
it also requires presenting an alternative. You got it? That, 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 that preaching presents an alternative and not a duplication of what people get all week long. When people come to, yeah, okay. Um, after noticing the idols, Paul then goes to the synagogue, the marketplace, and the Areopagus. You see that? He goes to the synagogue, the center of worship. He goes to the marketplace, the center of business. He goes to Areopagus, the center of education and philosophy. He goes to the church. He goes to the business sector, and he goes to the halls of academia to present an alternative. The alternative was the gospel. He is not on his home court, but he's confident enough in what he has that he's willing to take it anywhere. Preacher said we got a gospel for any and everywhere. We have an alternative to what is around us, and it will travel. How many of you all know the gospel will travel? The gospel does not need the advantage of home field. <laughs> there are some things that are so good that they can win without. Jesus was not on home field when he cast out the legion of demons from the demoniac of Gadara. Jesus was not on his home field. We certainly won't preach this, but if we were, right about here. <laughs> Jesus was not on his home field when he said, peace be still, to the contrary, winds of adversity and all that. Jesus was not on his home field when he descended into hell and preached to the spirits. We have an alternative about which we do not need to be sheepish or embarrassed. I'm confident that the gospel can stand on its own two feet in the synagogue, in the marketplace, and in the, in the Areopagus. I agree with Brueggemann that, church, that the church has a job, the preacher has a job of inviting the community to reimagine the world as though Yahweh were a key and decisive player. In this sense, preaching and ministry are subversive. Brueggemann is correct to say that preaching is never the dominant version Ministry and preaching are always a version, a rendering of reality that lives under the dominant version. The dominant version is one in which God is not seen as a key player. Subversion is that without God, I could do nothing. Without him, I would fail. Without the Lord, my life would be rugged, right? Like a ship without us. And listen, it, in an effort to reach the surrounding culture, we don't need to replicate the culture. We offer an alternative, and we need to be confident in the alternative we offer. There's nothing wrong with being innovative in ministry, but we do not have to succumb to the temptation of being trendy. Let me say it again. We need to be innovative without being trendy. Third time. Can you all hear me in the back? We need to be innovative without being, to be, listen, and, and there's a big difference between being innovative and being trendy. To be innovative means to be daring and creative in implementing, implementing fresh technique and cutting edge programming. To be trendy means to assimilate to what everybody else is doing around you in order to appear to be progressive. <laughs> to be trendy is to try whatever seems to be trending, even if it doesn't fit your context. Even though we do not have the home court advantage, we do not have to replicate and duplicate the surrounding culture. There's nothing wrong with the church, with church life being different than the rest of life. It's all right if worship spaces look like churches. It's all right if clergy look like clergy. It's cool. It's all right if we still sing all hail the power of Jesus' name and not just 7-Eleven songs. You all, you all know that, right? The same seven words 11, 11 times. It's, it's all right. It's still all right if our sermons include references to the cross and to heaven. 
We do not have to dumb down in order to reach out. It's okay for us to be strange, weird. There's nothing odd, there's nothing odd about the church maintaining its oddity. Resist the temptation to secularize preaching. Keep God in the center of it instead of human aggrandizement. <sighs> Paul was confident enough in the alternative to, to present it without apology. We have something that we can lovingly declare in our messaging and our loving of people that will work even if we're not on our home turf. The gospel always works. Love always works. Service always works. Sacrifice always works. If we're going to do fruitful ministry in this time where we're no longer on home court, we no longer have home field advantage, um, it requires confidence and alternative. It, 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 it requires us, right, uh, being okay with the alternative. It requires us noticing but it may also mean going back farther in our messaging. Now, need everybody hear this, please, please. It may mean going back a little farther in our messaging. When, when Paul finally gets a hearing in front of the meeting of the Areopagus, he starts with talking about where they are with the gods they serve. He had seen, he had seen the altars with inscriptions to the unknown God. Right, 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 to, to the unknown God. Paul takes his messaging back further than he typically would in order to connect with where they were. When, when Paul preached in Antioch, he went as far back as Egypt and Canaan land in his preaching because that's where his audience was. When Paul preached in Thessalonica, he went as far back as preaching the necessity of the Messiah suffering because they had a conception already of the Messiah. You got it? When Paul preached in Ephesus, he talked to them about receiving the Holy Spirit because that's where they were. In all of these places, the church had some semblance of home court advantage. But here in Athens, Paul was playing an away game. Therefore, he had to go back a little farther in his messaging because they had no pre-understanding of gospel categories. He had to go back farther because that's where the people of Athens were. In our settings, and I promise you, I'm almost done with this. In our settings, Christian privilege has been dethroned. Therefore, our preaching and our theology and ministry may have to start farther back. Our listeners, to some degree, have learned to construe the real practice of their lives without reference to the claims of God. When I grew up, where I grew up, Columbus, Ohio, um, I was not exposed to Judaism or Islam. The only thing I had been exposed to uh, was all things Christian. Therefore, my pastor, when my pastor preached, he didn't have to go beyond John 3.16 because that was enough for us, right? Um, when my children grew up, they had friends who were Jew Jewish and Muslim. Our preaching and teaching to them had to go back farther because their Christian worldview had been exposed to other worldviews. We did not need our Sunday school teacher to talk to us about why Jesus was the way of salvation, to salvation. It was just assumed for us. But because of the dethroning of Christian privilege, today's Sunday school, uh, church school teachers may have to go back farther because they're starting at a different point. When my children grew up, they don't, they don't and it's just, just, it's just the way it is. I don't mean to offend nobody, but just the way it is. But when my children grew up, they only saw male and female romantic interaction on TV. That's not the case. Y'all got quiet. <laughs> That's that, but that, that's not the case for my grandchildren who I'm raising now, right? Therefore, with them, I may not be able to begin with the birds and the bees. I may have to travel back to some creation narratives and on and on and on. All I'm trying to say is our starting point is now different. 
when it comes to the proclamation of the word. Paul goes back farther in his preaching and teaching. <clears throat> However, he ends up at a destination point where all of us should end up in our preaching and teaching. He starts off with the unknown gods, but he ends up talking about one who has been raised from the dead. <laughs> because we are no longer on home court, we, we may have to have different starting points in our ministries and preaching, but we should end up at the same place. All roads lead to the empty tomb. Sometimes we criticize the old and black preacher, old black preacher for always choosing, closing their sermons with the cross and resurrection. But maybe that's not such a bad practice. Charles Spurgeon once said to his students at Preacher's College, gentlemen, gentlemen at that point, wherever you start your sermon, make way as rapidly as you can across country to Calvary. <laughs> Gardner Taylor reminds us that Calvary is our central theme. He says, don't let the devil drive you from our central place. Calvary is the place where God got underneath all that was wrong with the world, turned it upside down in order to turn it right side up. Calvary was the place where God met the enemy head on and turned him back. Calvary was the place where God did all that needed to be done once and for all, forever, so that he never needed to go back there. And the last cry that issues up from Calvary is not the cry of a defeated soul. It's the exultant shout of a victor as he mounts the red altar steps toward coronation. That will work home court advantage or no home court advantage. Preach that. We may start way back here, but we all ought to end up at the same place. Now, that's all I wanted to share with that. that that's just, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to just give us some sense that the world in which we preach now is a world where we no longer have home court advantage. We, all, we used to begin with certain presuppositions that people believed. People had shared Christian premises. We had ideas about what, it, about what family meant, what family looked like, et cetera. Um, we're on somebody else's field now. All of our games are what? away games, which means we have some different obstacles. So I want to stop there and let's, uh, let's talk about this. We've got 27 minutes left. Let's talk about this whole um, issue of the, the social climate that sits in Lieben where we, where we preach. We'll start over here. Yes. Thank you, Reverend. That was pretty good. So I would say not only are we playing away games, but if we talk about the church capital C, the offensive line doesn't talk to the defensive line, and the quarterback <laughs> is mad with the special teams. And <laughs> so, so not only do we have an away game, but we're like shooting ourselves in the foot. Because now people don't even want to come to the church because we're even mad at each other, we're canceling each other, we're doing this, we're doing that. So how, what, what would you say about that? I would say nothing more than what you just said. That's, that is true if you want to carry that metaphor all the way out. Yes, that the infighting, the going back and forth about certain issues within our own circle sometimes depletes our energy from really engaging the principalities and the powers. So you're right. Yep. Yep. Somebody else talk to me. Well, how, how do we do ministry? How do we preach in this kind of climate. Up here. Good. I, I'm always fascinated by this passage because uh, he starts with an inscription from a 
a, a well-known Greek poet mm -hmm. uh, to, the, uh, to the unknown guy. And it seems to me in our time, we're going to have to start with some of the common poets now. We've got, we got all kinds of musical poets. I hear you. That our people are listening to that we can use. As starting points. As starting points. As starting Just your point. comments on that. Right. And so when we include or when we um, integrate um, even poetry or music, uh, because all those things do is they give us insights into human nature. And so insights into human nature are a great place to start in terms of preaching. And now you don't want to end there, but you definitely want to to start there because it establishes common ground. Thanks. I'm thinking about um, human nature and also thinking about it requires a lot of intentionality to know who's sitting in the pews, to make those relationships, to like take the time to um, ask the questions, where are people at with their faith and what requires them to move forward in their faith. And I feel like preaching, it starts at knowing who is sitting, sure. who's sitting at the pews, who's listening, and what are their needs. Sure, sure. And how, how, how do you do that? How do you, how do you find out, how do you stay in contact with who's in your pews? And I don't just mean physically, but what do you say? Fellowship? Okay. Yeah. Somebody else. How do you? How do you do that? How do you, in, in preparing sermons, some of you do it week after week, some of you do it periodically, but whatever the case, how do you stay in touch with the worldview and the mindset of people that are in there? You look at the community around them. What's happening in the community? Where, where are they living? What are the issues that they're living with and dealing with? Sure. Look at what they <laughs> look at what they post on Facebook. No doubt about it. Yes, sir. Uh, when I started in uh, ministry at 47, uh, an executive pastor gave me some great advice. He said, "Boy, uh, you come from an environment where you're always around non-Christians, and you're always being challenged to to represent Christ." And he said, "Now you're going to come into church world. Now he said, you come into church world." And now you're going to have to be intentional about being around non-Christians. Sure. And I think that that's still the challenge for pastors. Pastors need to be around non-Christians and, and hear about us from their perspective. Your thoughts on that? How do we distinguish, and I'm putting these questions out there because I feel like these are some of the important salient uh, issues are connected with this whole presentation, and, and that is, how do we distinguish between being trendy and being innovative when it comes to our ministries, and how do we understand that difference, and why do we even need to understand that difference? Anybody have a comment about that? How do we, way back there, yes, sir, between being trendy and being innovative, or is there a difference? Maybe, maybe they're the same. Yeah, I would say that the difference in my mind between being trendy and being innovative is being innovative is based on need and being trendy is based on popularity. Okay. So you create ideas based, innovation is creating ideas based on need that you see in the future or maybe in this moment, but being trendy is based in, basing ideas based on what you see that's popular. Somebody else will add to that. Because we, we all have to deal with that, that tension sometimes and that temptation in our ministry to, to be able to distinguish between that difference. Based upon what's, what's prompting us to okay. do what we're doing, are we being prompted by the spirit 
or are we being led by culture and current events and things of that nature? Although sometimes the spirit does work through that. You know, if we're not, in my opinion, if, if we're not processing and, and reading and understanding uh, what's happening with Israel right now, then we are becoming irrelevant to to how we can minister to our people and to enlighten them. They shouldn't get the news only from ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox. They ought to be getting the news. Well, what does God have to say regarding what I'm reading and what mm -hmm. I'm hearing? Okay. Another hand here. Uh, I was going to say that the difference between being um, innovative versus being trendy is I believe trendy puts, puts a pressure on us that that's well outside our uh, level of comfort and skill versus being innovative, we feel compelled to do something that may still pull us outside of our comfort zone. And I think on a trendy end, there are some of us who are looking at what others are being drawn to and feel the need out of pressure to have to conform unnecessarily. And so we said that because we preach on well, we have all these away games now when it comes to our preaching, when it comes to our doing church. He said that preaching and ministry has to take a few things to account. One, pay attention, right? Second thing we said was to be comfortable with this alternative that we present. And the, uh, what was the third thing? I think I forgot now. Oh, we have, may have to go back farther in terms of our starting point in, in preaching. Does that make preaching more difficult now? I mean, the fact you used to be able to stand up and assume that people had a familiarity with what the word salvation means or the idea of some of these different doctrinal terms. What, what, what challenges does that present for your preaching, for our preaching, in terms of how far back we have to go now with the listening ear? I believe it presents a challenge for us to have to uh, think about our word choice to be concise because a lot of the people that we're preaching to, they have shortened attention spans where some of our predecessors in the past, they had 45 minutes, an hour they could go in a sermon. Mm -hmm. But now you, gotta, you have to be really intentional about your word choice and placement to help take people back but then bring them forward and make sure that they're getting – uh, one solid direction with the sermon, you know, because sometimes our temptation can be, hey, you know, go here, go there, crisscrossing, but at the end of the day, people still don't have a, a clear understanding of why did you take them back there and what was the reason behind it. And so there needs to be woven into preaching now some apologetics, some, some defense. We don't want to spend a whole sermon uh, simply defending the faith, but last night, um, we heard, again, two amazing sermons, and uh, Dr. Curtis talked about what it means for us to be Christian. To, to some extent, there was an apologetic there defending this oft-criticized and sometimes even caricatured um, idea of what it means to be Christian. And so we may have to go back and not make certain assumptions. We used to, be, we used to assume, right? that people had ideas of what some of this stuff meant, but it may take a little more work to go back and not make certain assumptions. That is a real challenge when it comes to our preaching. Uh, I had two gentlemen at my church uh, this last Sunday. One of them has only been to church twice in his life, and the other one, it was his first time ever setting foot in the church. Do you feel that a uh, away game defense approach also works for people who don't know the rules of the game? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't even need to expand on that so much. Absolutely. Because um, the, we may feel like we're at home in our own buildings or church buildings, but there are a lot of people there who create kind of that away game uh, mindset, and there are people there who have no categories of faith or religion. 
And so we have to be conscious of that as we're writing and as we're using different theological terms in our preaching, because some of them, um, my dad, who transitioned to eternity now, used to, he pastored for 48 years in Columbus, and he, he, he told us that when he was little, he had a paper route. He, you know, you know, used to deliver the paper and the Columbus Dispatch. And he said that it was his job to walk down the sidewalk and he would throw the paper up on the porch. Sometimes his aim was off and the paper would find itself up on the roof of someone's house. He would once, once, the owner of that house who wanted that paper saw that the house, the newspaper was, was on the roof, they would report it. And my father, little boy, delivering the news, would get fined because he would have put the newspaper where the people couldn't get it. I wonder how many of us need to be like, get, 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 get fined for putting the news <laughs> so high that people can't people can't get it. Uh, I'm sorry. One here, and then, and then, then they will come here first. And I was uh, listening to you talk about the, the larger chunks of information, and over here, like kind of thinking out loud, that having to go further back may also demand that we be more intentional about having a pedagogical method integrated into our preaching. Sure enough. Um, integrate into the preaching and outside of the preaching moment where we have classes, um, maybe vacation Bible school or whatever we, we may call it, Summer Bible Institute, may, needs to go back and deal with some real fundamentals, again, that we take for granted and some cultural kinds of things that we wouldn't typically include in our curriculum. So, I used to coach basketball, and my girls are from the inner city. We would go out to these country places. I had to prepare them to play at away games, their own, just what they would receive, the people, how they were, you know, would act toward them. Speak to how our churches need to be able to now, since we're not we're at away games, how do we receive those that come in with tattoos or come in, you know, how, so how do we prepare our church members that we're away, even in our own home? Absolutely. We, um, recently did a funeral, and down after the funeral, people having to repass, you know, chicken, potato salad, green beans, and the red church punch. Um, <laughs> we're, we're downstairs with that, and standing right in the doorway, going into the church, were about two or three people out there just smoking weed. <laughs> you know, yeah, passing it around, and uh, I'll just kind of walk through it, and they just, they didn't, they didn't stop. They just kept on going. I mean, that's, that's what you call away games, right? And uh, so, got it, you're right, you're right. Everything that comes along with the culture, we got to be ready to, to deal with. Yes, sir. So, <clears throat> the whole book of Daniel is an away game. They're in Babylon. Sure. Wonderful. Nebuchadnezzar's renaming them with Babylonian gods and... In the midst of it, God gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream that Nebuchadnezzar can't understand. And none of his wise men can help him. And here's why. Because the gods don't dwell among men. And so this becomes the church's greatest hour. Because God uses Daniel to tell Nebuchadnezzar what's going on in his life. I think if there has ever been an hour of Isaiah 54, where, where the Lord has given me the tongue of a disciple. He wakens my ear morning by morning to know the word that will sustain the weary. That we live in a culture of many words, and there are words everywhere, but there is a longing for a word from heaven. Gabriel said, I speak to you as one standing in the very presence of God. If there's ever been a day where we, especially as, as preachers, need to be in God's presence ourselves. And that God is going to release 
the, the same keys that he gave to Peter. Those keys open up the kingdom. There is a key for every heart, for every person, for every situation. Absolutely, they're different. They're different. We need to notice. We need to know that. But, but there, we can't just listen to them. We need to be listening to him because there's a key. And God's given people dreams that they can't interpret. Their lives, what's going on in their life, they can't interpret it themselves. And they're not going to ask their buddy because they know their buddy doesn't know. They're looking for something. So I, I just, I feel like when we're in the presence of God, we're always at a home game for us. And, and, and so I just think that needs to be part of Thank the you. conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and I would say to that. If you don't have it already, pick up a book by Walter Brueggemann called The Word Militant. The Word Militant. Because in that, he uses exile as a metaphor for where we're always doing ministry. He said the church is always in exile. I love it. Yes, sir. Uh, excuse me. Thank you. When the uh, Bulls won that 72 and 10 that year, uh, one of the commentators asked, how did y'all keep winning on the road? How did y'all keep winning on the road? And he said, because we turned our road games into home games. He said, the triangle offense worked everywhere. It worked at home and away. He said, what we did is got together the leaders of the team and knew who to put in which part of the triangle. And sometimes us leaders just need to know where to put who in which part of the uh, triangle so we'll turn our away games into home games. Okay, y'all are y'all are giving me some more stuff for this next time I do a present <laughs> presentation somewhere. I'm adding all of this. Daniel and Chicago Bulls, they're gonna think I they're gonna think I did some studying. I don't over here. All right, well maybe I'll give you another I'm sort of slow, so I'm still thinking about um, innovative and trendy. And it it strikes me that maybe Saul's armor was trendy. And the David's bag with the stones was innovative. There you have it. And it sort of goes with the other thing about who the preacher is and knowing yourself. So I feel like if congregations are like, Saul's armor is working in that congregation, but over here, we got a bag of rocks. And so let's see what we can do. I'm getting a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I'm just going to comment on this idea of the away game. I had some good friends who were challenging me who are from Europe, said, we are in the away game. They've been saying this for years to me. And last year, when I read some stuff and did some studies around, like, Madison is the 11th most post-Christian city in the United States. Okay, okay. Only to places like Seattle. I mean, Washington, D.C. is less post-Christian than Madison, Wisconsin. And you start recognizing the truth. And my friends were like, Chris, we've known this for a long time. From Europe, we get this because we recognize we're just missionaries to our culture. Wow. And the paradigm shift to recognize that I am not in the home game, as you're calling it, but I am a missionary in my own culture. What do missionaries do? You have to study your culture. You have to get to know what's around you. You have to get to know who's in the land and what the ideologies are. I think the problem is that we've assumed that we are in the home game to what you're saying, that we know the ideologies of people that we know what our culture is rather than taking a fresh look. I just want to encourage us to take the fresh look. Thank you. Thank you. These are wonderful comments, man. So, so helpful. And, I, and, I, and I'm not just saying that. This is really, really helpful. Yep. All right. <laughs>